Hark is still lounging in his wooden house with Char and Flea. Then he suddenly remembers that he needs to find a butler to accompany him to school. Char and Flea are puzzled as they witness Hark suddenly shouting butler. Hark offers the excuse that he wants to take a walk. School is still three months away, but Hark has yet to find a suitable candidate. While walking through the forest, Hark recalls a path leading to a certain place. As he follows it, he comes across a village inhabited by many living skeletons. The skeletons notice Hark's arrival and immediately gather to kneel before him, addressing him as their lord. Hark remembers that these skeletons are creatures summoned by the Summoning Core, which he defeated five years ago. For some reason, they have been following Hark ever since. Finally, Hark grants them land and they decide to settle here and establish a civilization. One skeleton wearing a green robe emerges as their leader, named Johnny. By the way, Hark is curious about one thing in this village. He inquires why there are other monsters here. Johnny explains that they are wild monsters gathered by flea from this region. They each live in their respective territories and obey Johnny's orders. Upon reflection, Hark doesn't recall the village being this extensive. However, he doesn't mind if the monsters want to live prosperously here. While Hark is here, Johnny wants to show him around the other areas. Hark is taken to the place where they grow food crops. Over the course of a year, he adjusts their crops according to the seasons and process what can be stored for an extended period. However, Hark is certain that the skeletons can't consume these food items. So it seems like all these crops are for the monsters. Afterward, Johnny continues to explain various things happening in the village. Hark enjoys observing Johnny's gentle personality and attentiveness. Other creatures are obedient to him, and he remains loyal to Hark. Johnny also carries himself with politeness. If his body had flesh and skin, he might appear like an ordinary human. In fact, Hark considers Johnny as a potential ideal butler he's been searching for. Unfortunately, Johnny can be quite talkative. Once he starts talking, he won't stop. Hark feels he wouldn't be able to handle hearing his chatter every day. Nonetheless, he genuinely cares about Johnny. Johnny notices that Hark's expression seems a bit downcast and asks if there's something he doesn't like. However, Hark avoids the question by praising Johnny. Afterward, Johnny wanted to take Hark to another place. However, Hark said he had some business to attend to so he couldn't go just yet. The day had turned late, and Hark felt tired from the tour with Johnny. His forest was supposed to be his place of solitude, but now it had become a residence for monsters. Suddenly, Hark felt a strong jolt from behind. The sound came from a one-eyed gulm also summoned by the summoning core. Her name was Jig Jen. Jig Jen sat down next to Hark in contemplation. Suddenly, Jig Jen handed a flower to Hark. Hark was surprised to hear Jigen's voice, which turned out to be that of a girl. Despite her appearance, her personality was rather quiet. She didn't cause any trouble, making her suitable to be a servant. The issue was her massive size, if you recall correctly, Jig Jen always seemed to be alone. Hark then asked if Jig Jen was bored in the village. With a hint of shyness, Jig Jen replied that she liked it. However, what Jig Jen meant was that she liked Hark. After all that, Hark still hadn't found a suitable butler candidate. He decided to return to his wooden house for now. Hark had been waiting for his return. She was still curious why Hark had shouted butler earlier that morning. Upon reflection, it seemed better to ask Flea to be his butler. Unfortunately, her father didn't allow it. The next day, Jig Jen approached Hark and told him she had thought of a suitable name for the Black Knight. With a proud demeanor, Jig Jen revealed the name to be Schwarzerkreiger. She mentioned that she had found the name on the internet. In a certain country, that name belonged to the god of destruction and creation. On that same day, Flea invited Char to visit the village of skeletons and monsters. Just like before, Char came up with the name for the village as well. Charm proposed the name Pandemonium. Without knowing its meaning, Johnny gladly accepted the name. On the other hand, we are shown a group of adventurers who are currently hunting a blue dragon in a snowy region. According to the heroes, this dragon is known as the Blizzard Dragon and it's quite large for its kind. They stand to earn a significant amount of money if they manage to defeat it. However, the dragon manages to escape amidst a heavy snowstorm. 
the dragon inadvertently collides with a snow-covered mountain and triggers an avalanche. Information about this incident reaches Gordo, who then informs Hark about it. The dragon flew from the Imperial territory and crashed before crossing the border into our region. While the dragon didn't enter our territory, there's a possibility it might awaken and sneak in. It seems the dragon is wounded due to being pursued by adventurers from the Empire. Gordo doesn't want the dragon to go on a rampage, so if he wants Flea, who is of the same demon race to assess the situation, Flea immediately declined, stating that she only takes orders from Hart. Without hesitation, Park makes it an order. Despite this, for some reason Flea still appears upset. Flea goes on to explain that a dragon of that size must have existed for a long time. However, Flea has never seen a blue dragon during the demon race's battles against humans, so she doesn't want to help a cowardly dragon that fled from a fight. Hart then asks Gordo to be given some time to think it over. As he leaves the room, Hart realizes that Char had been eavesdropping on their conversation. Hart apologizes for eavesdropping, but expresses her desire to help the blue dragon. After being pressed by both Char and Hart, Flea has no choice but to agree to it. After that, Hart and Flea headed to the snowy area where the dragon was spotted. Hart used his projection to search in all directions. It didn't take him long to locate the dragon. Not only that, Flea also spotted a group of adventurers who were about to arrive at the dragon's location. They both hurried over. Fortunately, they arrived just in time. They got there just as the adventurers were about to launch an attack. Hart immediately cast a healing spell on the dragon. Meanwhile, Flea seemed eager to finish off the adventurers. If Hart hadn't protected them, they might have been incinerated by Flea. After the adventurers surrendered, the dragon finally stood up. Hart introduced himself as the Black Knight, but for some reason the dragon exiled breath that froze Hart. Of course, Flea scolded the dragon for being disrespectful to her master. Fortunately, Hart managed to thaw himself out from the ice. He also got angry even though he had just saved the dragon, but was treated rudely. At that moment, Hart heard the dragon's voice directly in his head, just like with Flea before. The dragon continued to gaze at Flea and asked why demon can seem to obey human. Flea immediately enthusiastically recounted their meeting from the beginning until now. Flea ended up narrating for a whole hour. With that, the dragon finally understood how remarkable Hart was. It never imagined that the demon king had been reincarnated. Hart himself had just remembered that he had once claimed to be the demon king. The dragon apologized for not participating in the war back then. It didn't like violence, so it had been living alone on a mountain for 300 years to avoid encountering others. Hart was fascinated to hear that it could isolate itself for such an extended period and wanted to know more details. Initially, the dragon spent its time in silence inside a cave. However, one day an adventurer camped there and accidentally left his book behind. The dragon read that book repeatedly until it became tattered. Over time, it developed a strong desire to read more books. The dragon eventually mustered the courage to leave the cave and head to the nearest town. It assumed a human form and went to a library. Occasionally, it visited the town to bring back books. The dragon repeated this activity to broaden its knowledge. However, it all came to an end when it was discovered by adventurers. All the books it had collected were burned to ashes, and the dragon was forced to leave its cave. After hearing its story, Flea felt sorry for it. Suddenly, she acknowledged the dragon as her sibling. Flea also allowed it to enter Pandemonium. Hart, who was hearing the name for the first time, was confused. Flea then explained that it was the name of Hart's territory, named by Char. The dragon felt delighted to be accepted. Then, as the blizzard dragon, it recognized Hart as its master. For some reason, Hart had a hunch that the dragon would transform into a naked human form. After all, he had already experienced it when he met Flea. As the dragon transformed, Hart covered it with a protective spell that instantly turned into a servant's attire. Finally, Hart removed his master and introduced his true identity. Hart sent this, the son of a count who ruled the border region nearby. Hart wanted to know the dragon's name, but it seemed like it didn't have one. The dragon then entrusted its name to Hart. Since it was the blizzard dragon, Hart named it Liza. 
Afterward, Hart took flight and asked both of them to follow him. Liza could still use its wings in human form, so it had no trouble keeping up with Hart. Meanwhile, Flea had to run as fast as she could to follow Hart from below.